evening, good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening. If you woke up this morning, 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 good evening. Good evening and welcome, welcome, welcome to Daring Dialogues. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm your host tonight, Shantae Charles. I hope that you're having a great and wonderful day. We are back at it tonight. And of course, we are doing more Black History reading for the month of February, but we always read something that is pertaining to Black people and Black history on a regular basis. Um, but we're spending some time this month to focus on leaders and inventors. And tonight we are um, going to be doing part two of our reading about the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, we got into it last night. We learned a lot of different things. We learned about the Cotton Club and Langston Hughes and the role that Prohibition played in the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, we learned about the Civic Club event that uh, many people mark as the official birthday party for the Harlem Renaissance. So we're going to continue learning tonight on that. And then also we're going to uh, start off tonight with an inventor from the book, What Color Is My World? The Lost History of African American Inventors, written by Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, compiling these this information. So let's jump right in. This is a very brief one, but fairly important, fairly important. This is inventor Joseph Lee. He lived from 1849 to 1905, and he invented wonder of wonders, the bread machine. Now, I had some uh, naan today, and it was naan today, and it was delicious. I normally don't eat a lot of bread, but if I eat bread, it's either going to be uh, Cheesecake Factory pumpernickel bread, which you can now buy in grocery stores, <laughs> or it's going to be some uh, Indian bread called naan, N-A-A-N. And if you've never had naan, let me tell you, you are missing out. So that is the bread that I currently eat if I do have bread and I had some today. So this is their, the uh, drawing, artist drawing rendering of Joseph Lee. Good evening to everyone coming in and to those who will catch the replay. And he invented the bread machine. The state of Kansas produces enough wheat annually to bake 36 billion loaves of bread. An acre of wheat can make enough bread to feed 9,000 people for an entire day. Without Joseph Lee, we might never have had fried chicken. He didn't invent fried chicken. He didn't even invent the breadcrumbs that coat fried chicken. What he did invent was the machine that makes bread and the machine that makes breadcrumbs. Despite his humble upbringing in Boston, he rose from his job as a bakery boy to become the owner of two successful restaurants as well as a catering business for the wealthy and the operator of a summer resort. In 1895, he patented the idea for a machine that would grind stale, otherwise unusable bread into crumbs to be used in cooking. After that, he invented a bread making machine that made bread faster than six people could and more cheaply. There go those two values again with African-American inventors. Faster, cheaper, lessening and lightening the load. Um, both machines are the basis for thousands of similar machines used around the world today. And this is a, a rendering of one of his patents. I believe 
this one is to is to um, create the crumbs. So, yeah. Thank Joseph Lee. Now that was a very short one. So let me do one more out of this book. I think this one actually goes right along with the one we just read. Lloyd A. Hall. He lived from 1894 to 1971, and he is known for bum ba da bum. Food preservation. What do you know? I mean, food preservation. Hmm. Before 1860, people thought food spoiled suddenly, like turning on a light switch. French chemist Louis Pasteur proved that microorganisms were behind food spoiling, which happened gradually as they grew and spread throughout the food. Look, I know germs and microbes and all those other microscopic creatures have an important place in the whole ecosystem. I get that. But some of them are just plain creepy and don't need to be in our food. Fortunately, Lloyd Hall figured out a way to do just that. No, he's not the kind of uh, exterminator that comes through a house and sprays termites. He's the guy who figured out how to keep our food from spoiling so that we can all eat fresher food at a reasonable cost. There it is again. He figured out how to combine sodium chloride with crystals of sodium nitrate and nitrite, which kept the nitrogen in the air from spoiling food. His patented method is still used today to preserve meats. He also discovered that some of the spices, such as ginger and cloves, that people were using to preserve food contain moles and bacteria that actually made food go bad faster. He invented a way to use ethylene oxide gas in a vacuum chamber to kill the evil microbes. Later, his method was adapted to sterilize prescription drugs, medical instruments, and cosmetics. So thanks to Lloyd and his more than 100 patents, we are all eating a lot better and a lot safer. Now, since we're on food, let's, let's do one more. George Crumb, very ironic name. He lived from 1822 to 1914. It is said that he is responsible for the potato chip. Potato chips use 10% of the U.S. potato crop. Potato chips are the most popular snack food in America right now. And worldwide, people spend $16.4 billion on potato chips every year. Finally, something many people really care about, potato chips. I couldn't survive one day of lunch without those yummy chips to keep my taste buds alive. Now, that's not my statement. That's the writer's statement. Thank you, George Crumb, for inventing them in 1853. Crumb was a chef at a fancy hotel in Saratoga, Saratoga Springs, New York. Half Black and half Huron Indian, he must have felt a little intimidated when, as the story goes, Cornelius Vanderbilt, one of the wealthiest people in the United States, sent his meal back to the kitchen, complaining that his potatoes were too soggy. Crumb sliced the potatoes thinner and cooked them, but Vanderbilt sent them back again. Crumb decided to teach the fussy money bags a lesson. He sliced the potatoes as thin as coins and fried them in boiling oil. Now they were too crisp to be eaten with a fork. And Snobs back then wouldn't eat with their fingers. To Crumb's surprise, Vanderbilt loved them, and they soon became so popular that they were sold throughout the country. Crumb made enough money to open his own restaurant, which served his Saratoga chips and catered to some of the wealthiest people in America. Y'all, potato chips, bread slicing, and dicing and food preservation. All black men, by the way.
while we are acting like we don't need black men in the world. Some people are. All right. Let's make our way back to the Harlem Renaissance and let's see how much we can get through on tonight. We are in chapter five of this chapter book and we're looking at a section called New Voices. Remember, we have just uh, talked about the birth of the crisis paper, W.E.B. Dubois, and also all of the writing that was coming out during this time, trying to describe Black people who were defining themselves. They weren't letting other people define them, they were defining themselves. In March 1925, Survey Graphic Magazine published a special issue, Harlem, Mecca of the New Negro. A Mecca means an important gathering place. Alan Locke later expanded the issue into a book called The New Negro, Voices of the Harlem Renaissance. Both the book and the magazine issue featured writers and artists who would go on to have long, well-regarded careers. Jesse Redmond Fawcett, the guest honor at the Civic Club Party, contributed an essay on Black comedies to Locke's book. Fawcett left her job as a teacher in Washington, D.C. She moved to Harlem to become a literary editor of The Crisis. There, she helped discover many writers of the period. She was the editor who published Langston Hughes' first poem. Fawcett also went on to write three more novels as well as poetry, short stories, and essays. Fawcett also hosted literary salons or parties where artists gathered. That's my kind of living. When all of this is over, I look forward to getting back to hosting artist parties, writers and singers and dancers and poets and painters and dramatists and musicians all in one space. After Fawcett left the crisis, she was unable to find work in publishing. She married and returned to teaching. Fawcett was living in Philadelphia when she passed in 1961. Several of Langston Hughes' poems appeared in The New Negro, but it was his poem, The Weary Blues, that made a real splash in 1925. It's about an old musician playing the blues excuse me, on Lenox Avenue in Harlem. Its sorrowful tones captures both the feel of the music and the way people in Harlem spoke. The poem won first prize at an Opportunity Awards dinner. Still, the honor was not enough to live on, for that, Hughes would need to make a even bigger splash. He moved to Washington, D.C. in 1924 to live with his mother. He had left college and was working as a busboy, clearing tables in a hotel restaurant. One day, he spotted a famous white poet named Vachel Lindsay dining there and took a chance. Now, a little cultural lesson on rent parties. I don't know if uh, some of you are familiar with rent parties, um, but I know um, more than once, I think my mother held a rent party. I don't know uh, all the details around it, but I do know that there was like an admission for people to come in and people were playing cards and they were you know, drinking and had the music going. So when I read this, I was like, hmm, this sounds like something that I also experienced as a child, but I'd have to ask her to be sure. Rent parties. During the Great Migration, Black people left behind lives as poor farmers, hoping to find better jobs in big neighborhoods like Harlem. Apartment buildings soon became overcrowded. Landlords responded by dividing rooms into smaller spaces and raising the rent. In order to make ends meet, people in Harlem often threw rent parties. Hosts would place cards advertising the event in the elevators of their buildings. The cards often began with a rhyme like, some wear pajamas, some wear pants. What does it matter just so you can dance? Guests would pay a small fee to join in the fun. Cheap drinks, food, and live music were the attraction. If the party was big enough, the host would earn enough money to pay their rent for the month. As Harlem night spots became more popular with white visitors, the rent party became a place to have a drink that the tourists had not yet discovered. Langston Hughes recalled this. He kept the invitation cards because he was intrigued 
by the little rhymes at the top. Later, he said of the parties, I could still hear their laughter in my ears, hear the soft, slow music, and feel the floor shaking as the dancers danced. So upon meeting this well-known writer at the time, Vachel Lindsay, Hughes boldly slipped three of his poems onto Lindsay's table. The poet was so impressed by the poetry that he told the newspapers about it. Soon, Hughes's photo appeared in papers around the country. It was great publicity. One of Hughes' best known poems is called Harlem. It is about what happens to frustrated hopes. It begins with the line, what happens to a dream deferred? Although he's most famous for his poetry, Hughes also wrote novels, short stories, essays, and plays. Zora Neale Hurston was a friend of Langston Hughes who knew how to chase dreams. One of her short stories was featured in The New Negro. Hurston was born in Alabama, but grew up in Florida. Her mother died when she was only 13. Life was hard, but her mother had told her to jump at the sun. We might not land on the sun, Hurston said, but at least we would get off the ground. Hurston jumped high. She ended up studying at Howard University, a historically black school in DC. The school's literary magazine published her first story. She also joined a literary club started by two professors, and one of them was Alan Locke. In 1925, Hurston moved to New York and became part of the Harlem literary set. But what Hurston really wanted was to be an anthropologist. Now, they study human behavior as well as societies, both past and present. This interest was reflected in her work. She had a good ear for language. She wrote the way everyday Black people spoke during that time. In 1927, Hurston began collecting Black folk tales in Florida that would later become a book called Mules and Men. In 1936, she was awarded money to study folklore in Jamaica and Haiti. During this time, she wrote her best known novel, Their Eyes Were Watching God, which if you are a student listening tonight, more than likely you might be assigned Their Eyes Were Watching God in high school. Um, although with all this attack on black history, it might be taken off of your reading list, but it is a very powerful book. It tells the story of a hopeful young black woman from Florida. Some consider it one of the most important novels of the 20th century. Several poems and an essay on music written by Claude McKay were published in The New Negro. Jamaican born McKay had lived in the American South. It was there that he first experienced intensely bitter racism. He later wrote, in 1914, he moved to North to New York City. He said Harlem was like entering a paradise of my own people. Langston Hughes wrote in a loose style, sometimes called jazz poetry. McKay, however, used traditional forms of poetry like the sonnet to write about inequality. He traveled the world speaking out against American racism. He wrote several novels, essays, and articles on black life in America. He passed away in Chicago in 1948. Each of these writers were just part of the voice of the new Negro. Although their styles of writing were different, they spoke with a new pride in being themselves. Black, educated, well-traveled, and outspoken, the new Negro had arrived and not just through the written word. So here's the artist's rendering of Zora uh, Langston and Claude McKay. Now, there was somebody also during this time that we need to know about, and his name was Arthur Schomburg. He lived from 1874 to 1938. Arthur Schomburg wasn't a writer or an artist. However, he played an important part in the Harlem Renaissance. He was born Arturo Alfonso Schomburg in Puerto Rico to parents of African and German descent. When Schomburg was a child, the teacher told him Black people had no history. Schomburg set out to prove his teacher wrong. He became a historian. The essay he contributed to the New Negro was about understanding the past. Schomburg moved to New York in 1891 when he was 17. In the 1920s, he began collecting works by African Americans. 
By 1926, he had over 5,000 books, 3,000 documents, and 2,000 pieces of art created by Black people. My kind of work. <laughs> Schomburg's collection became the basis of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture that remains in Harlem to this day. Long live the Schomburg Center and protect it from all harm. Last chapter for tonight, all that jazz. Thanks to the Harlem Renaissance, jazz was sweeping the nation in the 1920s. The decade became known as the Jazz Age. Jazz is uniquely African-American music born from black folk music and another style called ragtime. Ragtime was created by black musicians in the late 1800s. It is usually played on the piano and features a syncopated rhythm. That means that it does not follow an expected beat. The left hand plays a steady rhythm like European classical music, while the right hand plays a ragged rhythm. The result is lively, swinging music with bounce. Two famous ragtime pieces are Maple Leaf Rag and The Entertainer. Scott Joplin wrote The Entertainer and Maple Leaf Rag. And there is a artist rendering of him. Jazz inherited ragtime syncopated rhythm, but it has a looser feel. Jazz musicians often follow their own mood or imagination. As a result, jazz is never played the same way twice. Okay, jazzies, okay, jazz people. Jazz music appeared in places like New Orleans, Chicago, and New York City. It set toes tapping around the world. One of the fathers of ragtime and jazz was World War I Harlem Hellfighter James Reese Europe. Originally from Alabama, he became a popular band leader and composer in New York City. Europe's orchestra bridged the gap between ragtime and jazz. During World War I, his music started a jazz craze in France. Here is a rendering of James Reese Europe and his band. All right. Europe also broke down barriers preventing black musicians from playing in whites only clubs. He did this by teaming up his band with a famous white dance act, Vernon and Irene Castle. The Castle's popularity made Europe's band appear before many white audiences. Between dance numbers, the band often played a song called The Memphis Blues. It was written by a musician named W.C. Handy, who was also from Alabama. Handy and Europe were two of the best known black musicians of the day. Handy's nickname was Father of the Blues. Now the blues is another type of popular black music with roots in African-American spirituals. The blues often tell stories of heartache and loss and love. The castles liked Memphis blues so much that they created a new dance for it called the Foxtrot that's still popular in ballroom dancing today. Noble Sissel of the Shuffle Along fame had been part of Europe's Harlem Hellfighters band. Sissel once told Handy about being sent to play for wounded soldiers during the war. Reportedly, when the band struck up the blues, the American doughboys tossed away their crutches, danced and hobbled, yelling, they're from home, they're from home. <laughs> so this is a rendering of the castles, the dance team, and also uh, this is a rendering of the soldiers. Europe's band was one of the first black groups to record their music. Records had a huge impact in introducing black musicians to white people. In 1920, a woman named Mamie Smith recorded a song called Crazy Blues. Previously, black musicians were only recorded if their music appealed to white listeners. Crazy Blues was the first record by a black singer that was made for black audiences, and it was a hit. By 1923, black jazz records were among the most popular in the country. Names like Duke Ellington and Cab Calloway appeared on the scene. 
Edward Duke Ellington earned his nickname for his gentlemanly manners. Born in Washington, D.C. in 1899, he started playing piano when he was seven. As a teenager, he composed his first song, Soda Fountain Rag. Ellington moved to Harlem in 1923. By 1927, he was leading his own orchestra at the Cotton Club. One of his most popular jazz pieces is Take the A-Train, written by Billy Strayhorn. The title refers to the subway line in New York City that runs through Harlem. Cabell Cab Calloway III was born in Rochester, New York in 1907. Calloway started law school in Chicago, but left to become a singer. In 1929, he moved to Harlem. Two years later, his orchestra was also playing at the Cotton Club. Calloway was known for his white tuxedos, floppy hair, big singing voice, and noodle limb dancing. His best known song is Minnie the Moocher. And these are the renderings of Duke Ellington and Cab Calloway. These names are tripping me out. Because the Cotton Club was segregated, most African Americans rarely got to see some of the greatest Black musicians perform. Records and the radio helped to fill in this gap. And so did national tours. The popularity of the music meant Black orchestras were booked to play for white audiences. Even so, on the road, the musicians were often barred from hotels and restaurants because of their skin color. And once white bands began to copy Black music, which they're still doing, they were often hired instead of African-American bands. Another big name in jazz was Fletcher Henderson. Henderson's band was extremely popular, especially after a new trumpet player joined in 1924. His name was Louis Armstrong. Armstrong had grown up a poor kid in New Orleans. His puff cheek trumpet playing earned him the nickname Satchmo for Satchel Mouth. Armstrong liked to improvise. He became known for his fluid technique and dazzling high notes. According to one scholar, he also sang with a distinctive, warm, and gravelly voice that made scat singing popular. Now, scatting is something that I personally like to do. It is a style of singing nonsense syllables that express feeling through sound rather than words. And only someone who does the scat would call them nonsense syllables. <laughs> Armstrong went on to become one of the most important jazz musicians in the world. His song, What a Wonderful World, is still popular today. Two other famous singers of the Harlem Renaissance were Bessie Smith and Ethel Waters. Smith was known as Empress of the Blues. She was one of the highest paid singers of her time. Ethel Waters was known for her warm, emotional voice. She started singing in church choirs in Philadelphia when she was only five years old. As a teenager, she performed under the name Sweet Mama Streambean. Waters became a sensation after singing W.C. Handy's St. Louis Blues. Once she moved to Harlem in 1919, she gained even greater fame as an actress. But it was music that had put her in the spotlight. From ragtime to the blues and jazz, African-American music holds a place of cultural importance. To this day, jazz is considered to be a uniquely American art form. This is a lovely rendering of Ethel Waters. All right. And that concludes the section on jazz. Tomorrow, Tomorrow, we are going to be looking at one of my favorite things to talk about, and that is the artists, the visual artists of the Renaissance. Um, a lot of, um, I would say my work as an African-American artist is definitely influenced by the artists of the Renaissance. It's influenced by um, the artists who portrayed visually things about the great migration it's influenced by the painting style it's influenced by 
the multimedia is influenced by the collage style of the Harlem Renaissance period. So I'm going to get into that on tomorrow and I may even try to whip out some of my art pieces and show you guys some of them. So we'll see. All right. So this is what I wanted to cover on tonight. I hope you have enjoyed the reading. Um, if you would like to come on and share, I'll give a moment for anyone who would like to come in and share on IG. You can click on the camera. If you are with us on YouTube, I want to thank you for watching and for your time and attention. And also tonight, if you're listening by podcast on anchor.fm, uh, on Daring Dialogues, our podcast there. I want to thank you for your time and attention and taking a moment to listen to some Black history. Have a wonderful day and good night. Good evening. Good evening. You know, I didn't see the camera. So I looked at it, I realized why. Because I had typed in good evening and never sent it. So that was still there. Uh -oh. <laughs> but, but anyway, I wasn't going to go here and then you went there. So I just got to stop off this little poster. And the degree continues. Still in our music, and you're getting hired simply because of the color of your skin. Now we got that covered. Let's do let's do a piece of inventors like Joseph Lee. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, man, I'm telling you, breadcrumbs. Those things you use those for pretty much anything now. Yeah. Breadcrumb. Yeah. Hmm. But I wonder if this family is collecting uh, um, royalties and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. Bread, bread, again, here you go. Saving money. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, uh, uh, building the economy. Mm -hmm. Saving well, money, building the economy, making the process go faster, saving uh -huh. human resources, yes. helping everybody enjoy bread in more, uh -huh. in even more ways. Taking what people would have normally thrown away because of its staleness and refurbishing it for yet another use. That's another kind of quality, you know. When we talk about uh, what do they say? If taking something, if making something from nothing was a people, <laughs> yeah. That's if making true. something from nothing was a people, like people. Well, that's like People give you nothing or they give you, you know, if you think about the formerly enslaved, they would give them all the parts of the animals they didn't want. And we made it a delicacy. And we made it delicacies. And now if you go to some states and some places, those delicacies are priced out of black people's abilities now to buy them. The poor. Right. Right. Exactly. That's ridiculous. Exactly. <laughs> so you took something that poor people put together and now mm -hmm. you have curated it and made the price so high that unless they're on a farm and know how to you know do what they do mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they can't even buy they can't even buy how you have set it up in the store now right go try to buy some ham hocks and neck bones and see how much they cost yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> You're like, wait oxtail, a minute. Oxtail. 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 It's amazing. It's like, really? Mm -hmm. This is what we're doing now? This is what we're doing. This is what we're doing. Yet again. <laughs> it's like, you're just like, how many times? How many times? <laughs> Potato chip, who I don't really yeah. know. I don't really know too many people who don't like potato chips. Oh, but then his last name was Crumb. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> which which I, goes back I to the breadcrumb guy. Not having any crumbs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then um, the other guy. The food pre- the food uh, yeah. I'm just like, so we would have rotten food without him. Mm-hmm. We'd have food Real just. Fast rotten food. We just have our food, food just. Act, yeah, our food lasts longer because of him. So, so you like, mean to tell me every time a racist raises their spoon to their mouth, they got to think about a black man? Because in their mind, they're probably thinking of white. They're probably they, in their mind, they're probably giving the black a, a white man the credit. Oh, I tell you, it's amazing when you think about it. Like the ridiculousness of some of the attitudes and behaviors, and it's like if you just start breaking down all the things that you're currently using that either a black person invented or improved upon, so you could. Use it better. It, it it should make you think. Why am I holding certain views that don't make sense? Well, that's also like they don't want to. They don't want us to earn any money. But yet, we're the one that keeps the economy going because we're the biggest group of, of our consumers in the United States. Yeah, okay. that whole that whole spending thing. What are we up to? Like one point three trillion trillion or something like that in spending. Mm-hmm. Something like that. Something like that. Yeah. And so all it all it takes really is for us because... to stop spending for stop spending for thirty days and see what happens. Oh yeah, they will go crazy. Just say I'm just gonna I'm just gonna stay at home. I'm just gonna keep my money. You know, I'm not you know going to be going out to any any major branding places. You know, I, I've got enough clothes. I don't need to buy anything for the next 30 days. I mean, I, you know, and, and, and hey, even in those 30 days, we could cook something and have potlucks in our neighborhood and share food. Right. And not go to the store for 30 days. Hmm. Yeah, we, you, see, you see, we should do that. The whole, <laughs> every, every, every city of the country plan that undercover and do it. Call it a blackout. You know, I thought about doing that for um, February. I thought about just taking seven days and not getting on any social media, not posting anything. They would lose their minds. Yeah. They would lose their minds because they thrive off of they thrive off of the advertising dollars Mm-hmm. And the culture that's created by the things that we put out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so if all black people did that for seven days, that would mess them up. Just seven people, days. People don't at, don't yeah, buy anything. In a negative way also. Don't buy people anything. Do have a potluck with the black people in your neighborhood. Yeah. Exchange clothes yeah, well, if you need to, so you don't have to buy no clothes. Have a nice yeah, little swap that? meet in your neighborhood. Well, see, <laughs> if we put those, if we put those two together and did both of those for seven days, you don't even have to do the uh, the spending thing for thirty days. Just those seven days alone mm-hmm. will put a big dent in the economy. Turn off the television. You know, no uh-huh. no ratings for TV shows. Right. None of that. Anything anything that helps to generate advertising dollars, just disconnect uh-huh. from it. Mm-hmm. For seven days and see what happened. Oh yeah, they would feel it. They would really, they would really be talking about, about it. <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't say, "Oh, we got to do something. We got to do something to uh to to uh, to get them to do more, not not to do another day like another seven days like this. We got to do something. We got to please them in some kind of way." They would never go there. They would talk bad about us. Find some way to put us down and stuff like that. And instead of saying, oh, wait a minute, we need them. You know, we need to do something to make sure that this doesn't happen again. See, that they don't go down with that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, would, I would love to just see black people just take seven days away from everything that does not benefit us. 
just take seven days and focus on your community, your direct, immediate community. Mm-hmm. Your direct, immediate community. And if you live in a community with all white people, then go to the next community over that you know is all black. Yeah. And spend some time with your community. Seven days. Turn off the TV. Cook your food at home. Share food with your neighbor. I, I almost want to say almost like a like a uh, Kwanzaa, but just a but just a community Kwanzaa. But listen, it's not like we can't do it because Hurricane Andrews and some of the other hurricanes. Mm-hmm. That's how we could do. Right. Oh, I know. I no lived lights. in Andrew. Yeah, no lights, no lights from August all the way into November. And I remember that because my birthday is in November. And I remember like we were coming towards my birthday and we still didn't have lights in our community. And we were taking and we were taking we had built a makeshift um, shower container around the fire hydrant. And the community was taking baths in the fire hydrant because we didn't have water yet. See, see now, that's very resourceful. Mm-hmm. We are very resourceful people, yeah. which is why we invent all this stuff. Yeah, my grandmother taught me during that because um, she would ride a, a three wheeler. She put me in the back of her three wheeler. My grandmother got a set of wrenches. Because she was concerned about the older people in the in the community at that time not having um, fresh water and things of that nature and people not being able to get to them in time to help them. So my grandmother rode around the neighborhood with her wrench and showed me how to turn on the fire hydrants in the neighborhood to get fresh water out. I would have never thought of that you know, as a young child, but we turned on the fire hydrants and people were able to get fresh water flowing because we didn't have water. We didn't have ice, you know, just basic things. So she wound up getting like a neighborhood citizens award from the county for like her quick action and quick thinking. Mm. Um, But my grandmother did that kind of stuff all the time. Like, Uh And I, I attribute that to her charity roots. She just knew what to do because that's how she grew up. So, yeah, I think it's I think it's something that we can that we can think about in terms of like what is something everybody can do, you know? What is something everybody can do that is doable for a short period of time to show solidarity, but also to show like we can do this with ourselves. Because to me, it's not even necessarily about proving anything to anybody else. But it really is about saying what we need to get back to as a community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we were there. Yeah. We were there before integration. We were there. The community was the community. Mm-hmm. You had your neighborhood stores. Yeah, my family still has a has a corner store that's been around over fifty years now. Yeah, you had your yeah, yep. you had your neighborhood gas station that was owned by blacks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, and so we we had all that. We had the clothing stores that black folks ride around in the cars selling clothes. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, we, 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 you're right. Mm. You had the, you had the vegetable and cane man that used to ride through the neighborhood. Yep, you're right. Selling vegetables and meats. Mhm. You're yep. right. Vegetables and meats. Yep. Yeah. He would come around. He had the he would I forget what they call him, but it was something about the truck, and he would or the vegetable man, whatever they would call him, and he would come through. Mm-hmm. And you would get your you would get your fresh vegetables, and then he would have like a cooler full of meats, and you could decide like what kind of meat you wanted for a certain amount, mm-hmm. 
and and get your get your um freezer filled up. That's a different that's a that's a different kind of living, man. <laughs> now everybody want to Uber Eats car. <laughs> oh my goodness. Now everybody wants a Uber Eats car to come to the neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah, and you uh -huh. and you paying thirty dollars on top of whatever it costs for your food for somebody to bring you some food. But her um, yeah, it's something to think about. Definitely something to think about, and how uh -huh. we could organize it so that it would be a national thing. Now, of course. Yeah, I know now, of course, when you start talking about national plans of, of community gathering, you know somebody coming for you. <laughs> yeah. That's just the bottom line. <laughs> yeah. Anytime you say love and happiness for black people, <laughs> uh -huh. love and happiness and peace and peacefulness, somebody's like, oh, we got to bust this up. Yeah, we got to this. Is the thing. This is the thing. If it becomes a national thing, yeah, you know, I'm talking about every neighborhood involved, every neighborhood of black people, community of black people involved, they can't stop it. They may be able to shut a few spots down, but they can't shut every spot down. Because, mm -hmm. number one, you're going to have municipalities that's going to say, oh, we ain't touching that. Yeah. You know, we're not going to touch that. These are people let them do what they do. You know, now you're going to have those that's, that's going to be all gone going. We're going to arrest anybody that that's involved in this <laughs> and stuff like that. Give no, but you, right? but you know, they'll come with the ordinances. You know, they'll come yes. with the ordinances like, oh, you know, a certain amount of people or hot food or you can't be outside serving this and you have to have a permit for this and that. Every 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 neighbor, we pick seven neighbors, and every neighbor have barbecued for the next night. One night of barbecue per neighbor. That's it. Everybody line up with their plate and roll mm -hmm. through. That would be there great. You go. That's it. That's it. That would be great. I mean, so how do you shut down? A, how do you shut down a picnic, a barbecue? How do you shut that down? <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, you know, somebody would have to say something about noise or the amount of pe people gathered, egress. I'm just thinking, and I know even in my neighborhood, we have like, I would say, fifty percent of the people on my street are African American, so it wouldn't be hard to pull it off here. Mm -hmm. Um, but maybe some other places where you're the only black neighbor. That's why I said. You would probably have yeah. to go to another black neighborhood. 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 Yeah. Like find your find your adjoining black neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And get to know the people around you. Yes. Get to know the people around you. All good stuff. All good stuff. Somebody out there listening, hopefully they will pick it up. Yeah. Because yeah. it would be it would be a definite undertaking. I would say that. Yeah. And hopefully they'll get caught up in our, in our reminiscing. Because <laughs> I'm telling you, that was good stuff, man. That was good stuff. Yeah. yeah. I remember my mom having card parties. And I remember her, like, charging at the door. I remember, you know, there was some alcohol involved. And people would have to pay if they wanted to drink. And uh -huh. then I remember... You know, she would set up card tables in the living room. It was like four or five tables with four people, five people at a table. And they would be playing cards. Some of them would be playing for money. Some of them would not be. So it would be like cards with people who are playing for money and then cards, you know, cards with people who just wanted to play. And I remember that. Like, it wasn't often, but I remember it because all of the children had to go in the room and close the door. We were not allowed outside. We were not allowed to be roaming with adults, drinking and playing cards. So I remember that part about it, that we had to stay in our room 
and not be seen by the adults that were there. I remember that. And of course, you know, we were girls, you know, and my brother. So I think that too was like a safety thing as well. Like we don't want you around drinking adults. And, um, you know, it's not like they were carding people or doing background checks and all of that. So, yeah, that's what I remember. That's what I remember. Well, thank you, uh, Patrick Ben, for allowing me to have this chat with you, this conversation. And I hope that you all got something out of the additional conversation, along with our reading on the Harlem Renaissance tonight and also the inventors. This has been another episode of Daring Dialogues, and I've been your host tonight, Shante Charles. Again, I want to thank you for your time and attention. Remember, light is the most daring opposition to darkness. So continue to go out and be what, Pastor Ben? Be light. Thank you, guys. And I hope to see you back tomorrow as we continue to look at the Harlem Renaissance visual artists. And I think I have a book on it. I'll bring that out as well. And we'll take a look at some of the artwork that was happening during that time period as well. Take care, everyone. And God bless.